Hello everyone, welcome to 2017 and Happy New Year. Uh, we're going to continue the video reviews of our CBP nonprofit research publication. Uh, this week I've chosen one that came from the European Spine Journal in 2001. The title of this project is called Slight Head Extension, Does It Change the Sagittal Cervical Curve? By myself, the lead author, my late father, Dr. Don Harrison, uh, Dr. Tad Yannick, uh, the late Dr. Bert Holland, uh, Dr. Len Siskin. And this was published in uh, 2001 European Spine Journal, Volume 10, pages uh, 149 through 153. Uh, this is quite an important topic when we talk about before and after x-ray analysis in chiropractic practices or in surgical settings when we look at before and after alignment of the cervical spine after surgical interventions. The, the concept is shown here on this particular slide where on an initial lateral cervical x-ray we have a slight tilt down of the bite line or the hard palate line. So if I looked at uh, the back of the frame and magnum here to the hard palate or if I looked at the teeth, the bite line, this person would have slight flexion or a downward tilt on their initial lateral cervical x-ray. And then we look at the lateral cervical curvature and we note there's a mid cervical slight kyphosis and then a straightening configuration of the cervical curve. So the question arises, is the loss of the cervical curve, the straightening in that mid cervical kyphosis, is that due to the head flexion that's present on this neutral uh, lateral cervical? So this creates a little bit of debate, controversy, and concern. So here's the post intervention x ray. And this is after about 10 weeks of intervention. You can see that the cervical curvature has changed quite dramatically, but there's now a leveling, if you will, of the bite line and a slight extension of Chamberlain's line. So did the cervical curve change exclusively simply because the head was tilted down on the first x-ray and now it's not? Or did the intervention itself change the cervical curve? This is the question this research project attempted to address. Now, previous studies never really looked at this issue. Previous studies, what they did is they took a neutral lateral cervical and then they altered the position of the, the head and neck on a post lateral. For example, they had a neutral and then they tucked the head down. Or they had a neutral and then they retracted or translated the head backwards. And then many authors claimed, based on those studies, that Therefore, there's a change in the cervical curvature when you alter the position of, of the uh, head and neck in the sagittal plane. But the reality of it, what was never really addressed is what we're looking at this on this slide. The initial lateral cervicals showing an alteration in head position followed by a post-treatment or a post-assessment where we've now leveled the head and neck to see what has happened. So in this study, what we did is we took 40 consecutive prospectively selected neck pain patients that had mild to moderate neck pain. These were not acute trauma paces. These were considered subacute and moderate uh, uh, severe uh, chronic neck pain. So mild to moderate uh, subacute uh, to chronic neck pain. And we had an initial lateral cervical x-ray. Now on the initial lateral cervical x-ray, there had to be head flexion on that initial evaluation. Then what we did is we had the subjects uh, sign informed consent, read our research project, and then we ascertained another uh, lateral cervical on the same day, approximately 20 to 30 minutes later, with the subject's bite line leveled by extending the skull. Okay, so it says here, a second lateral cervical x-ray was taken on the same day with the subjects in, in a more neutral head position with the bite line visually level. Thus, we took an initial with sli slight head flexion and then a post with either neutral or slight head extension to see what the effect on the lateral cervical curve was. So the idea is this, B shows the initial x-ray, and I'm sorry they're out of order, but B is the initial x-ray where we have a decrease in the cervical curve and a tilting down of the head and neck. And then A shows the neutral x-ray where we extended the subject on the second film. So actually B came first, then we did A. Now the problem is if we only look at the, the top of the cervical spine and the bottom of the cervical spine with a measurement, for example, the Cobb angle which goes from C1 to C7. If I use this Cobb angle through C1 and the inferior end plate of C7, 
in the head uh, neutral position, this shows a curvature of 20 degrees. In the head flexion position, this shows a curvature of zero degrees. So you might look at this and go, wow, that's a big effect on the cervical curve. There's a 20 degree change in this cervical curvature due to the head flexion. Well, not really. Did the cervical curve itself really change or did only the upper neck change? And if you look at this figure, what you'll notice is it's really only the atlas that's shown to be changing in this schematic here. So what we have to do is we actually have to assess the entire cervical spine for its segmental angles as well as the total angle of curve. So I'll talk to you about the measurement methods coming up. Number one, we looked at the cervical curve C2 to C7. That's the back of the body of C2 and the back of the body of C7. We call that the absolute rotation angle. That's going to be our primary assessment for the angle of cervical curve. But if I can back up, we also looked at C1 to C7. So we wanted to look at the very top of the neck relative to the bottom of the neck. So we used a Cobb angle at C1 to C7 as well. Then we looked at the segmental relative rotation angles or juxtaposition angles using posterior body lines and that's shown in this middle figure or figure B. So these are our segmental angles. These become quite important. Is it only the top of the neck that's changing or is it actually the mid and lower cervical spine that's changing? And then we also looked at Chamberlain's line. Chamberlain's line goes from the posterior aspect of the skull or the posterior aspect of the foramen magnum to the back of the hard palate line above the upper teeth. Chamberlain's line is classically used to assess what's called basilar invagination shown by C2, the tip going above that line. However, we can also use this Chamberlain's line to look at the skull relative to horizontal as a measurement of head extension and flexion on these before and after lateral cervicals that we ascertained. So Chamberlain's line is something that we looked at as well. Results. In our 40 subjects, the average amount of extension on the second x-ray taken 20 minutes later, this is not a treatment film, this is just leveling the skull in space, the average amount of extension required to level the skull was 13.9 degrees, so 14 degrees. We looked at correlation coefficients. This head extension was not substantially correlated with any segmental or global angle of lordosis. Okay? Subjects were categorized into those requiring slight head extension. We categorized slight head extension from 0 to 13.9 degrees. And then we uh, categorized those with significant head extension above that 13.9 degree mark. In other words, we'll say 0 to 13 degrees and then 14 degrees and up. That's what we called uh, slight or significant head extension. So slight was less than 14, significant was 14 or more. And you might go, well, you know, how much is 14 degrees of extension? Well, if I look at the range of motion of the skull in extension, a healthy young subject can extend by about 60 degrees backwards with their skull relative to a neutral position. So 14 degrees is roughly 25% of the available range of motion. So I, I would argue that that's significant head extension, right? So anything less than that we could say would be slight head extension. That's what we did in this project. So here's what we did. In the subjects that had 0 to 13 degrees of head extension on the second film, we noticed the C2 to C7 ARA, the posterior body from C2 to C7, change was 6.9 degrees. So the change in curve was 6.9 degrees for subjects with under 14 degrees of extension. Okay, Roughly what that translates into, you could say, 50% of the amount of head extension was shown in the amount of change in the cervical curve from C2 to C7. In other words, just under 14 degrees of extension caused about a 7 degree increase in the cervical curve C2 to C7. However, 80% of that 7 degrees was in the upper neck, C1 to C4. So 80% of that 7 degrees, which is really 4.2 uh, 4 degrees, is in the upper neck segments, meaning that you're not going to see much going on between C4, C5, C5, C6, and C6, C7, which is where the majority of loss of the cervical curve or cervical kyphosis occurs. Also, 
only one out of 40 subjects that happen to be in the significant head extension group, that means more than 14 degrees of extension, only one subject with a very slight cervical kyphosis actually changed from a kyphotic neck to a lordotic neck on the second x-ray using head extension. In other words, 39 of the 40 subjects did not change the configuration of their neck curve at all. Kyphotic necks remained kyphotic necks. When I took a neutral with slight head flexion and then extended them, the kyphotic neck remained. It didn't magically appear to go to lordosis as, as some people would argue. In other words, our findings suggest that slight head extension on a follow-up film does nothing to the mid and lower cervical curve. It does nothing. There's no statistically significant effect. So here, here's a table showing the significant differences uh, between the two groups, broken down into slight head extension versus significant head extension. Remember, to be in slight head extension, you had to have less than 14 degrees. To be in significant head extension, you had to have greater than 14 degrees. So we had 20 in each group. You'll notice the statistically significant changes in the curve are in, in the, what we call the global measurements, the gross overall measurements. So that means the top of the curve relative to the bottom. But then when I start looking at the segmental angles, you'll notice there's no statistically significant differences in the segmental alignment. In other words, you don't see these dramatic segmental changes. What you do, or what you do see, is you see an endpoint change that's primarily driven by uh, the upper neck changing, and that's skull down to C4. Again, 80% of the change is in the upper neck. So just to show you a couple examples of this, here's a case uh, out of our 40 subjects. This is the initial neutral lateral cervical film. There's slight head flexion. And, sl oh, excuse me, this one's significant, I'm sorry. It took 18 degrees on the second film 20 minutes later to level Chamberlain's line. And I would argue that's a lot of extension. Now look at the shape in their neck curve. Did their neck curve change? And the answer is absolutely not, it didn't change. Didn't change at all. Why is this relevant? Well, if I do see a change on the post x-ray, then it's driven by the treatment that I did. It's not driven by an artifact of the patient positioning on the x-ray. So this is a very important topic for chiropractors or PTs or, or uh, osteopaths or orthopedic surgeons, whoever it is, looking at before and after x-rays. Now you'll notice the top of the neck changed quite a bit. Skull to C2. There's a change in the, the upper upper neck curve. Yeah, I, I agree. But really, that's to be expected. That's where the initial phases of head flexion and extension occur. So let's look at another one. You'll notice the same thing going on. This person is in the significant head extension group. They have more than 14 degrees of extension between this initial film and this follow-up film taken about 20 to 30 minutes later. Did the cervical kyphosis change configurations? No, it did not. What we see, the effect is in the upper cervical spine. Again, if I then see true change in this kyphotic neck following care, I'm confident as a clinician and also based on this research project that I did that with the patient. It's not what we'd call a positioning error or artifact. Okay. Now, the, all, the other reality is, why even take an x-ray of a subject when their head is looking slightly downward? Why even do that? Well, you know what? Here's why we do that. The neutral lateral cervical x-ray is highly repeatable from person A to person B. So, if, if I x-ray person A day one and I x-ray person B day one, and then I wait a day later and do it again, I'll get the exact same position in these subjects unless they've had recent acute trauma, like a recent whiplash injury, okay? Even if they have chronic neck pain, the x-rays are gonna come out the same. It's repeatable. Also, I wanna see what their neutral resting posture looks like. If the person has head flexion in their posture, that's part of their alteration in their alignment. That's part of their problem. That's part of their dysfunction. I want to see the effect of that head tilt on their cervical column. So I want to see what it looks like. But also, I also understand that this tipping down on the initial film is not going to change this reverse cervical curve to alertosis simply by tipping the head back upright. That's the issue. 
So when we look at this from a uh, kinematic point of view, and you'll notice this initial head flexion extension is really occurring in the upper neck. Now if I go to full flexion extension, then you'll see the entire cervical curve start to change. But if I only do partial flexion and extension, you'll notice it's only in the upper neck where we're seeing the change. So this is our animation of the effects. Uh, my computer's a little slow today, so I apologize for that. So let me, let me reiterate this concept. So based on this research investigation, based on the hypothesis and based on the results. Th so the hypothesis would be this. I have an x-ray of a person with a lateral cervical curve or a, a, excuse me, a, a lateral cervical x-ray of a person with chronic neck pain, my apologies. They have 13 degrees of head flexion on their initial lateral cervical. I look at their mid-cervical spine and I notice there's a mid-cervical reversal, a mid-cervical kyphosis. The question is, is that mid-cervical reversal due to that head flexion? The answer from this study is surprisingly no. That hypothesis is rejected. Head flexion and extension in the initial phases does not affect the mid and lower cervical curve. Discussion, just to reiterate. In the current study, we found an average head extension change in Chamberlain's line of horizontal or two horizontal of our 40 subjects of 14 degrees. Okay? This only had a minimal effect on the cervical curve, C2 to C7, of about 7 degrees. Okay? But again, that 7 degrees, 80% of that was in the upper neck. It was not in the mid and lower neck. Okay? So roughly, that's a uh, 2 to 1 difference. So if I have 14 degrees of head extension, I might uh, expect to see a change in the ARA C2 to C7 of 7 degrees. Now, are these results similar to what's been reported in the literature by other authors? Of interest, the answer is yes. In uh, 1989, in the European Journal of Orthodontics, Helsing et al. studied this very same thing on ortho, uh, orthodontic lateral, uh, what they call cephalometric x-rays. So we look at the, the lateral skull and the cervical spine for an orthodontic analysis. They looked at the cervical curve. They identified 20 degrees of increased extension caused only a 10 degree change in the cervical curve. In other words, that's a two to one different, or two, a two to one of a result, right? 20 degrees of extension, 10 degrees of effect on the cervical curve. In other words, half the amount of the head extension is shown in the cervical curve. That's identical to what we found of interest, okay? Therefore, if we assume a one half to one ratio as found in the above two studies, then what I would expect for somebody that had a 10 degree tilt on their neutral lateral cervical, I would expect if I leveled that on a post treatment, I would expect only a five degree change in my cervical curve. Okay, so I expect half the amount. This is, important top, this is an important topic. What we actually see in the traction trials that we've done, the traction studies we've done where I take subjects with chronic neck pain and they have loss of the curve and we put them through a treatment protocol. At the end of about 36 visits, nine to 12 weeks later, we take a follow-up lateral cervical x-ray. That follow-up lateral cervical x-ray almost always shows a little bit of head extension on that post-lateral cervical compared to the pre. The reason is because of the extension traction methods that we're doing. However, if we look at the results of the traction on its effect of the cervical curve, we find three and a half times more change in the cervical lordosis than would be expected from head extension alone. Putting all these things together, I then now have a clinical position that I can take a firm stance and say, you know what? I'm very confident in the fact that if somebody has head flexion on their pre-X-ray, I'm okay leaving it in there. And then on my treatment X-ray, I'm okay with a little bit of head extension on that post-treatment X-ray. I know, number one, the change in the cervical curve in the mid and lower segments is not driven by the, the difference between the neutral lateral flexion versus the neutral lateral with slight extension. And then also I know that my changes are roughly three and a half times greater than would be expected by just changing the position of the skull. So just to summarize, 
Head extension by less than 14 degrees to level the bite line on the lateral cervical x-ray results in very small changes in the segmental angles. It results in roughly a 50% uh, difference in the, the uh, total cervical curve compared to the amount of head extension. In the vast majority of subjects, cervical kyphotic segments were not extended into lordosis during slight and significant head extension. Only one out of 40 subjects noted, uh, we noted a difference. These results fail to support the hypothesis that correction of kyphotic cervical curve deformities results from patient malpositioning errors on post-treatment x-rays. In other words, you can be confident in the results that you see on the lateral cervical follow-up x-ray that those results are driven by your interventions and not by just simply a change in position of the patient's head and neck on the x-ray. Hopefully you enjoyed this simple uh, biomechanical analysis. It has profound impact, in my opinion, uh, to clinical practice and to patient relevant outcomes on lateral cervical x-rays. What I'd like to ask is patients out there, although this one may not be the most relevant for you in terms of treatment, it does add credibility and evidence to why your chiropractor that does chiropractic biophysics technique does the procedures that they do in the manner that they do them in. If you are a patient out there and you're looking for help for chronic neck pain, headaches, or other health conditions, please seek out a chiropractic biophysics or CBP trained chiropractor. You can go to our patient directory. There's a lot of information on there and you can seek out CBP trained chiropractors anywhere in the world. Go to cbppatient.com. Also for chiropractors out there that might be watching this, two things. Go to idealspine.com and check out more information on chiropractic biophysics and also consider helping us uh, support and perform these types of scientific studies. They're sorely needed in the chiropractic profession and in spine sciences in general. You can go to cbpnonprofit.com and you can donate to our Spine Research Foundation. Until next time, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. Thank you for your time and attention.